hello, good evening, afternoon, and good uh, morning to all our speaker chairs and the wonderful audiences of the SNS webinar. Welcome back to this last edition of webinar of the month of January 2022. Today, we are going to hear two educational uh, lectures uh, from two most brilliant minds in neurosurgery. The first speaker of the ses first session is one of the most academically young, active uh, neurosurgeon from Cameroon, Dr. Ignatius uh, Essin. Dr. Essin is a senior lecturer at the Department of Neurosurgery, University of Bermanda, Babili, Cameroon. He obtained a master in neurosurgery, neurology, cum laude, and doctorate uh, degree in neurological surgery under the aegis of the World Federation of the Neurosurgical Society and auspicious of the Cameroonian uh, government. He is the current chair of the WFNS YNS committee and is the, also the chair of the Young African Neurosurgical Forum. He has published several manuscripts in various peer reviewed journals and is also the deputy editor of the recently launched Journal of Global Neurosurgery. He is one of the torches barrier of the online education in neurosurgery during this pandemic. We are extremely honored to have him with us in this webinar and he will be talking about one of his favorite topic, which is car current challenges in research in neurosurgery. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Harvey Huawei. Professor Wei is the Associate Professor at Department of Neurosurgery, Huasan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai. He is a medical graduate from Jilin University in China in year 2005. He had his neurosurgery specialist training at Hwasan Hospital, Fudan University, where he also obtained his PhD degree mentored by Professor Liang Fu Zhao. Dr. Harvey is specialized in neuro-oncology and immunotherapy, and his research interests are epigenetic and metabolic mechanism of gliomas. We are extremely honored to have him today with us, and today he will be talking about real-time intraoperative molecular profiling of IDH-mutated glioma, with mass spectroscopy. The chair for the first session today is our honored guest from the United Kingdom, Dr. Angelus Collais. Dr. Collais is a clinical senior lecturer and honorary consultant neurosurgeon in the Department of Clinical Neurosciences, Edinburgh Hospital and University of Cambridge, Cambridge, UK. His interest includes a neurotrauma, neuroendoscopy, anterior skull base, pituitary surgery, and spinal surgery. He is interested in the methodology of clinical neurosurgical research, particularly trials and global neurosurgery. He is the core chief investigator of four NIHR-funded randomized trial in the field of neurotrauma and the associate director of the NIHR Global Health Research Group of, on Neurotrauma. He was the past head of the World Federation Neurosurgery Young YNS uh, Committee. We are extremely great thankful to him for accepting to chair the session of Professor Essin. The chair for the second session today is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Kazuhiko Kurozumi. Professor Kurozumi is the professor and chairman in the Department of Neurosurgery, Hamamatsu University School of Medical, Shizuka, Japan. He is a prominent member of the Japan Society of Neurosurgery, as well as a member of the Japan Society of Gene Therapy, uh, Japan Society of Skull-Based Surgery, Japan Society of Neuroendoscopy. He was honored to have several grants and awards in his illustrious careers, namely the Journal of Gene Medicine, Japan Society of Gene Therapy, Young Investigator Award, America Society of Gene Therapy, ASGT Travel Award, Japan Society for Neuro-Oncology, Hoshino Award, the Kane Foundation for the Promotional of Medical Sciences Research Grant. He's a prominent author and has published several manuscripts in various peer review journals. We are extremely honored and thankful to Professor Kurozumi for accepting our invitation to be the chair of the session of Dr. Huawei. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome all the chairs, speakers, and the wonderful audience to this online platform of SNS webinar. A warm welcome to our colleague in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. 
uh, Professor Raja is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online uh, podium to our first chair, Professor Angelos Polias. Professor, please. Hello there, and thank you very much for the very nice uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really pleased actually to be uh, here today, especially uh, given that the um, speaker for the first lecture is Ignatius Zasena, who's a very close friend of mine and a very good colleague. And he's my successor in the uh, leadership of the Young New Resources Committee of the WFNS. Uh, also, I'm very pleased to be here because the, the topic is a topic that is very close to my heart. So we know that research is essential to improve patient outcomes. There is no other way, really, for advancing patient um, outcomes in patient care. Uh, all of the advances that we have um, seen in neurosurgery in recent years, and obviously, you know, also in fields outside outside neurosurgery, they have come about because of research. And I know that we have done a lot of work with Ignatius and other colleagues, which have shown that there are issues with the uh, research capacity and the research outputs as a result of uh, low and middle income countries. And we're working together to try and um, enhance the uh, capacity and the capability of clinicians in LMICs. Um, so I'm uh, just very interested to hear what Ignatius has to say today about the uh, challenges in terms of the quality of research. Uh, I'm sure it will be a very informative talk. Uh, Ignatius, over, over to you. Thank you, Angelus, for the introduction. Thank you, Raja. It's a great honor for me to be here with the young Asians neurosurgeons. I mean, Professor Kato is a mentor to all of us. And uh, Raji, uh, Raja, I want to congratulate you for the good work you're doing with the young neurosurgeons in Asia. Uh, well, I've been closely working with one of my collaborators here in Africa, Kobile, who's in Cape Town, and she we helped in putting up this presentation. And once more, I want to thank Angelus. I mean, if we'll be able to ensure that there's research equity across uh, between LMS6 and HICC is due to the effort he put in when he was the chair of the WFNS Young Neurosurgeons Forum. I also want to extend our greetings to my friends in the Journal of Global Neurosurgery, which is one of the projects we, we succeeded in doing last year to ensure that uh, we narrow the gap in research equity between LMS6 and HICC. So there is no conflict of interest except for the fact that most of the concepts I'm going to present here are based on the principles of evidence-based medicine, because I believe that to be able to offer adequate or optimal patient care to patients, we need to uh, institute or apply the principles of evidence-based and neurosurgeon. So when you look at the, the, this, uh, this map, you will notice that uh, there is very wide gap in, the, in terms of research output between HICs and, uh, and LMICs. You can see Asia here is contributing to 19% of research output. This was a paper published in 2010, and recent papers haven't shown much uh, difference. And uh, up to 75% of research output comes from North America and Europe. So the rest of the countries in Asia, uh, Latin, uh, Latin America, and Africa need to do much to be able to mitigate and narrow this gap. The problem of research is not only related to the quantity, okay, it's a problem related to the quality of research. And this is ubiquitous. It's not only found, it's not only a problem found in LMICs, it's also a problem which we have identified in HICs. So in the denominator, we have problems related to the quality, which we identify in across the world. But in addition to that, we have the problem of the research productivity in HICs. Today, we focus much on problem related to the quality because it's a problem that touches almost everyone. So we look at the research output from neurosurgery, up to 80% is level four and level five, and only 2% is uh, in level class one evidence. So this is a very big issue compared to other surgical specialties like the orthopedics, urology, and the cardiovascular surgery. And this led to uh, Richard Horton, who is the editor-in-chief of The Lancet, to, in, uh, who uh, he challenged neurosurgeons to be able to produce high quality research and turn away from case reports and case series and try to produce more surgical uh, trials. At the end of this lecture, since our target is young neurosurgeons, we hope that they are going to be able to understand the simple approach to clinical research methods in neurosurgery, understand the anatomy and the, and the physiology of study designs, the relationship between study design statistics and how this is applied to patient care through the, the principles of evidence-based medicine. I'm going to give some practical examples to see how the consequences of poor quality research can affect patient care. So, Clinical research is generally classified as a, a, a qualitative and quantitative. 
we've written much on quantitative research and quite recently with the team, uh, the Cambridge team uh, with uh, Angeles, my very good friend, we've published a, a few papers now on qualitative research. Okay. It's one of it, which we actually one of the first in neurosurgery where neurosurgeons are being encouraged to be able to explore this avenue because when you have to look at a, a pathology or maybe a symptom like pain, there's no way you can up, uh, evaluate pain based on quantitative methods without complementing it with the qualitative method it gives you a holistic view of the way the patient feels the pain. So neurosurgeons need to adopt these methods, which are already adopted in other clinical specialties to be able to uh, provide optimal care to the patient. Today, we'll be focusing on quantitative research designs. And these are some of the problems we've detected. There are problems related to the methodology of reporting. There are problems related to the reporting of study designs in neurosurgery. There are problems related to the sample size calculation. There are problems related to the, 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 the grading of evidence it can either be upgraded or downgraded depending on the way the studies are reported. So we, the first problem we, we identified was that there are many confusing approaches to look at study designs in neurosurgery. I, as you can see from this diagram, there are so many approaches and it makes it very confusing for the novice to be able to understand how to approach research. So we developed an algorithm in 2016 to be able to answer this question. And we published it in 2016, but surprisingly, a year after, another algorithm was published and, uh, in the Journal of Global, uh, Journal of Neurosurgery with a lot of methodological flaws. You can identify here. They had classified uh, quantitative research into primary research and secondary research, which is correct. But under primary research, they talked about descriptive, non-comparative, and analytic comparative. This is some sort of tautology because a descriptive study is non-comparative, and an analytic study means it is a study that has a comparison group. When they went further to look at and descriptive studies, they mentioned just the case series. And we know there are many study designs that are descriptive. You have the case report, the case series, the descriptive cohort studies, and uncontrolled intervention studies, and other many study designs. I mean, there are many, up to 20 of them that exist in the literature. When you go to observational analytic of observational studies, they mentioned, they talked about the cross-sectional study, and then they talk about longitudinal study. I mean, these terminologies are vague. These are things we try to discourage. There's not such a thing as a retrospective case control study because a case control study can be prospective and retrospective just as a cohort study and they even mentioned a study design called the prospective cohort non-randomized and control trial you see I mean, this doesn't make sense there's no study design in clinical epidemiology called the prospective cohort non-randomized clinical trial a cohort study can never be randomized so and you saw this paper was published in one of the big journals so we need to be very careful with the way we look uh, we approach study design because it has so much consequences on the way we apply evidence on patient care so this was the algorithm which we developed and published in 2016, and it was based on five questions. So what we always encourage a young neurosurgeon is when you have to do research, the first question you have to ask yourself is, what is the goal? What is the aim of the research? Do you just want to go to the literature, pick up papers and summarize them? Okay, in that case, you are talking about the reviews. And when some statistics is involved, we talk about the meta-analysis. But if you have to conduct the nouveau research, you are talking about the primary study designs. The next question you need to ask yourself is, is there a comparison group? If there's no comparison group, you're talking about the descriptive studies. But if there is, then you are talking about the analytic studies or the comparative studies. When the descriptive studies, it depends on the unit of analysis. Are you looking at individuals in the population or you're studying the effect of an exposure at the population level? In that case, we are talking about the ecological studies or if they are talking about the, the individuals, you can talk about the case report, the case series and the descriptive study, cohort study. And this is actually one of the study designs which we introduced into the neurosurgical lexicology. When you go to anal analytic studies, it depends now on the relationship between who is allocating the intervention. Is it the investigator or the investigator is just observing patients in the natural environment? If you just observe, you talk about the analytic observational studies. Yeah, the, the generic ones are the cross-sectional study, the case control, and then the cohort. And as I said before, the cohort and the case control studies can be prospective and retrospective. There are other observational analytic studies, which I'm not going to get into today. And then, of course, if the investigator is allocating the exposure, we talk about the trials. They can be field trial, laboratory trial, or clinical trial. And these are, as I said, they make up just about 2% of the studies in neurosurgery. So we need to publish more of this kind of study designs. So having looked at this, we went further to look at the individual study designs in neurosurgery. So this is a paper which we published recently looking at observational studies in neurosurgery. And we started by looking at the case report. The case report may seem very simple. Everybody thinks that to write a case report is very easy, but it is not. The case report is a basic structure and a functional unit of research and every neurosurgeon, every young neurosurgeon needs to know how to write and publish a, a, a case report. We realize that up to 15% of studies published as case reports are actually not case reports. When you look at this table, you see uh, these are papers published in the top neurosurgical journals, the neurosurgery, neurosurgical focus, world neurosurgery, and journal of neurosurgery. You see two papers here 
with a sample size of 11 and 12. The one is published as case reports, the other is published as a case series. This is a problem. We look at two papers here with a sample size of four. One is published as a case report, the other is published as a case series. So there's some confusion as concerns the sample size of case report and case series. So we looked at this problem and based on our knowledge of uh, on the clinical uh, stati or biostatistics, clinical epidemiology and clinical medicine, we're able to uh, uh, st uh, develop a statistical proof to show that the maximum sample size for case report should be five subjects and uh, can let you understand this has been widely accepted in most biomedical journals and you can see here on instruction to authors in the journal of um, neurosurgery every paper published as a case report need, needs to have a sample size from one to five subjects above five subjects you can have to look at other study designs depending on the relationship between the exposure and the outcome so a good case report sometimes should something which is maybe rare and a typical event, something which is unique, something which is exceptional, can be a, a rare complication, okay? But what we added new in the, into the literature was the sample size of less than equal to five subjects. And sometimes in journals, you see case reports have been published as brief reports, adverse effects, letters to the editor, how I do it, case study. So these are the different types of case reports you find, uh, you find in the literature. And the good case report has to be written under five headings as described by Debeke in, sometimes in, 19, in the early 80s. And recently, they have the, uh, the care guidelines, which helps to guide authors to be able to write and publish an appropriate case report. Having looked at the case report, now we move on to look at the case series. We realize that if you go to PubMed, which is one of the biggest database, there is no merge term for case series, which is a neglected study designs, especially in surgery. We evaluated case reports published in the top 31 neurosurgical journals over a period of 70 years. And we realized that up to 70% of studies published as case series were actually not case series. 55% of them were descriptive cohort studies. Only 30% were actually the true case series. And this was a, a cover editorial in the child nervous system. So what is a case series and what is, uh, uh, what is a case series? To understand this, you need to first of all understand certain terminologies the word exposed non-exposed cases and controls because this is the confusion has led to the misclassification of case series and the misclassification of case control studies when we conduct research especially when it is analytic there are four concepts which you need to understand you need to be able to identify the exposed or the patients having the intervention or the new technique the non-exposed those are which we are those whom we classify as the non-intervention group you have people who are going to have the outcome these are the disease or the cases that those without the outcome are known as the non-disease or the controls so when you are doing a case a, a cohort studies you are looking horizontally the exposed to the to comparing the exposed to non-exposed or just the exposed group in the case of descriptive cohort studies and we are looking at the case series we are looking at just the cases that's patients having the outcome okay if the case control study we are looking at compare the cases to the controls so this has been the confusion and we're able to sort, uh, sort this out. So but what is the problem with the case series in neurosurgery? People confuse the case series with the descriptive cohort study. To illustrate this, look at this, uh, this figure. If you go to a neuro, a neuro oncology unit and pick out patients in the neuro oncology unit that were operated for a super, supercellar meningioma, and then the investigator looked back into time and looked at which surgical approach was used to operate these patients. If they were operated maybe through the transcranial approach or through the uh, Indonesian approach. This is the study design of a case series. This is different from the case uh, from the descriptive cohort study. With the case series, the selection of patients into the study is based on the outcome. With the cohort study, it is based on the exposure. So these two diagrams shows the difference between the cohort study, the descriptive cohort study, that's a cohort study without a comparison group to the case series, which is a study design, which sampling of patient is based on the outcome. With the descriptive cohort studies, the sampling of patients is based on the exposure. Another concept which is very important to note is statistically, with the descriptive cohort study, we can calculate the incidence, which is a probability, for example, the complication rate. With the case series, we cannot calculate the incidence. We can calculate only the odds, and it's a difference between the odds and the, and, and the incidence, as illustra illustrated here. Imagine you have 12 patients, okay, and three of them, patients seven, eight, and nine, they have a complication. If you have to look at the incidence or the complication rate, it's going to be three on 12, which is 25%. But if you look at the odds, which we calculate with the case series, it's going to be three on nine, not three on 12, which is 30%. And you know, with meta-analysis today, it's not possible, it's not, it's not uh, advised to be able to, to, to combine meta-analysis of cohort studies and case series and other cities. You need to be able to combine uh, the, the bring together studies that are having similar study design to be able to do a meta-analysis. So when you combine case reports and case series, 
and the descriptive cost studies in the meta-analysis, you're actually provi providing results which are going to be flawed. So you actually have to be able to do a meta-analysis of case series only, or of cost study, except you convert the, 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 the odds to the incidence. Again, to so able to write a good case series, there is a process guidelines that were developed recently. Process guidelines stands for the preferred reporting of case series in surgery. Okay, so if you use this uh, guidelines, you should be able to report a good case series without any difficulties. And again, to be able to report a good descriptive cohort study, you need to apply the STROP guidelines, strengthening the reporting of observational studies in epidemiology. Have you looked at the, the case series and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the case reports? We went further to look at the analytic observational studies. With the cross-sectional study, it's very easy to understand. We didn't find any uh, trouble in the, in the labeling of uh, cross-sectional studies. Likewise, we look at diagnostic studies. It's also, we found that there were no troubles. For example, this was, uh, we used a diagnostic uh, uh, test methodology to conduct this study to prove that the medial Hampton reflex was diagnostic of L5 pathology, which is a concept which has been neglected over, over many years. And it was written in most textbooks that there was no, actually no reflex for L5 reticulopathy. So using these study designs, observational studies, we can, we can be able to do a lot of clinical studies without going to other cities. But the most contentious was the case control studies. Cohort studies also are well understood in neurosurgery. Neurosurgeons don't have any difficulty understanding the cohort, especially the, the prospective type. When you come to the case control studies, this is where this is the bone of contention. You can see there are up to nine studies that have been published about case control studies in neurosurgery. And ours was the most extensive that look at 31 top neurosurgical journals over a period of 70 years. And here we were able to prove that up to 40% of studies published as case control studies were actually not case control studies. Uh, 30, about 34 percent of them were cohort studies. So we conclude that not every control study is a case control study because people feel that any study that has a control group is a case control study. This is not true. So what is a case control study? It's very difficult. It's, it's one of the most difficult study designs to do in, in clinical epidemiology. And when we published our paper, it drew a lot of attention across the world. There are a lot of people that we for our paper and some that were against what we were, uh, uh, some, uh, some of our recommendations. Many people supported the fact that we should be able to use the SOP guidelines to be able to improve on the quality of observational studies in your research, especially the case control studies. But there were others who, who claimed that maybe we are trying to create some sort of elitism in research methodology that we want to be able to evaluate all the studies published before they, are, they get uh, out in the market. But this isn't true. We are just concerned about the way studies are published in neurosurgery. And the editor in chief of the World Neurosurgery Professor Benzel had to come up with that, a short uh, letter uh, supporting the fact that and encouraging neurosurgeons to be able to apply this, the recommendations in our paper to be able to uh, report uh, case control studies appropriately. So, again, to be able to understand what a case control study is, we are comparing patients who are having the known disease, that is, the cases and the controls. Those are having the outcome to those without the outcome. So this is the design of the case control study. So we have we look at the cases and the, and the controls, and then we look back to time to see the intervention which they had. For example, if you go to a spine unit and you pick out patients that were operated for lumbar disc herniation, and then you select those that had dura tear CSF leak and compare them to those without the CSF leak, you look back to time to look at to see if they were operated with the endoscope or with the microscope. This is the study design of the case control study. Okay, so you, you pick out patients that are having the, the outcome in, in, in question, that is CSF leak, and compare them to those without the outcome in question. And they look back to them to look at the exposure which they had or the intervention which they had at the beginning of the study. Again, we are comparing people having the outcome to those without the outcome, and they look back to them to look if they had the exposure which they had. There's a difference between the cohort study and the case control study, and this has been the the, 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 the bone of contention, especially the retrospective uh, cohort study. With the cohort study, we're able to measure the relative risk. This is not the classical effect size we measure when we do the case control study. And again, if you look at the evidence-based hierarchy, the cohort study is placed above the case control study. So when you misclassify a case control study for a cohort study, you're actually maybe upgrading the evidence. And when you classify a cohort study as a case control study, you are downgrading evidence. And as I said before, only 2% of the study designs in the research are other cities. So when we downgrade our evidence, we provide low quality evidence. Spine surgeons are doing very poorly. Most of the studies that were mis misclassified were found in spine journals, uh, in spine journals. 
And these are some of the terminologies which you are going to find in the, in the literature, prospective cross-sectional case control studies. There's nothing as such in clinical epidemiology, the case control cohort study, this is not correct. Retrospective case control, match control, there's no study design as such. Prospective double blind randomized case control study. So these are wrong terminologies, I, I mean, which we find in the neurosurgical lexicology and neurosurgical literature. And this has led to uh, the misclassification of case control studies in neurosurgery. To write, to be able to publish a good observational study, we need to apply the STOP guidelines. The STOP guidelines exist for case control studies. They exist for cohort studies. They exist for, for, uh, uh, for, 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 for case control studies. Have you looked at the observational study? We went further to look at the surgical trials. They are not left behind. You know, we know the surgical trial is a gold standard for to provide evidence for patient care, but it is also the most controversial study designed in neurosurgery, as published by the some of my colleagues in the United States. And although the quality of, of uh, randomized surgical trials has increased over time, the quality remains very low. Up to 48% of RCTs published in neurosurgery are of bad to moderate quality. So you can understand the, conse the consequences. And there, this is because there are a lot of challenges in conducting an RCT in neurosurgery. One, one of the things I always emphasize on is the, the, the concept of the ex expertise bias. I mean, somebody like Angelos, he's doing a uh, pituitary surgery. When the endoscope came in, a lot of surgeons had already been using the microscope and then suddenly the endoscope was introduced into neurosurgery and then they started doing analytic studies. You compare the endoscope to the microscope. You've had 20 years experience with the microscope. It is, it is not, it's, there's going to be expertise bias when you try to compare the patients which you operated with the microscope to those with the endoscope because you have not had, had similar expertise exposure with the endoscope compared to the microscope. Similarly, patients who don't like to participate in RCTs because sometimes they prefer the minimal invasive technique to the old technique, okay? The surgical trials are also very expensive. So with all this, it makes it very difficult to carry out RCTs in neurosurgery. And that's why there are very few of them that are published. To be able to do, do a good RCTs, there's a, the, there's a console guidelines, which you find in the, under the equator uh, uh, checklist, which is consolidating the standards of reporting the RCTs. If you have to conduct an RCT, I would advise you meet a research methodology. You have to, you have to able to apply this, uh, these guidelines to be able to report the study appropriately. We also went further to look at the reviews. Many people feel that reviews are just about systematic reviews and the traditional reviews and meta-analysis. No, there's a very wide family of study designs that stem from the traditional reviews through the scoping reviews, systematic reviews, the croquet reviews, which are actually systematic reviews, but differ from the systematic, the classical systematic reviews in that you need to register the protocol upfront. Okay, they have the meta-analysis. And this quite recently we have what we call the overviews. Overviews are systematic reviews of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. These, these are not very common in neurosurgical literature, and we encourage neurosurgeons to be able to publish this kind of study designs. So in the paper that was published by uh, Paul Klimo, up to one third of studies published as meta-analysis do not even meet the basic definition of a meta-analysis. Most of them are just a collection of case reports and case series that are put together, and there's some statistical analysis are done. This is inappropriate. So we published uh, one of a commentary in the Red Journal where we explain how to appropriately interpret a meta-analysis. And this paper has been highly cited and is highly read by most young neurosurgeons. So what are the consequences of quality deficiencies on patient care? Everybody should be asking. So if there is this misclassification of study design, what, what does that mean to the patient? How does that affect the patient care? I'm going to illustrate it with this example. When you look at the question of endoscopic versus microscopic pituitary surgery, up to 10 meta-analyses have been published. Okay, including us, we published, I would do, this was my master's uh, uh, project when I was doing my master's in neurosurgery. And this 10 meta-analysis contains 73 primary study designs. But when you go into the details to look at the study designs, in about 52% of, design, uh, of, of the studies, the study design is not reported. So we don't even know what kind of study was conducted, except you go into the paper and try to deduce, but the, 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 the authors never reported the study designs. And then in about 32% of the studies, they are just stated as a retrospective study design, which is very vague. A case series, a cohort study, a case control study can be prospective or retrospective. So you look at already the first problem is that these studies were not, were not appropriately labeled. So it makes it difficult for those conducting the meta-analysis to be able to come out with a, 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 a good statistical analysis. So, one of the meta-analyses which was published recently and has been cited more than 250 times, <laughs> but when you look at this meta-analysis critically, you realize that there was a lot of methodological flaws. This is a typical example of what we talk about misuse and misapplication of uh, research, meta uh, research methods. Here, the author stated that in the meta-analysis that 
When you compare endoscopic to microscopic pituitary surgery, the vascular complication rates are higher in the endoscope compared to the microscope. It was very scary. I mean, a lot of people commented on this, but they never understood why the authors came to this conclusion. It was just due to the, the way the, the, the meta-analysis was conducted. We extracted the data and tried to understand what was actually happening. And we realized that the authors told us that there were 40 vascular complications and they, they were uh, in, among the 4,910 uh, 4, patients. And when you calculate the risk of having uh, a vascular complication, this was three times in the endoscopic group compared to the microscopic group. But this isn't true. Why did this happen? It happened because the authors combined descriptive studies and analytic studies in the same meta-analysis. If you look at the, the, the meta-analysis that was published, only four of the study designs were analytic. That is, only four study designs, only four studies were comparative. The, the rest of the studies were descriptive studies. And as I, as I told before, it doesn't make sense to combine descriptive studies and analytic, analytic studies in a meta-analysis. So when we extracted the analytic studies, that is studies that were having a comparison group, we realized that there was actually no difference in the complication rate between the endoscope and the microscope. So we therefore concluded that there is no difference in the vascular complication with the endoscope compared to the microscope uh, with regards to pituitary adenomas. Of course, we therefore said, when conducting a meta-analysis, make sure that you compare all the comparable things. Don't take apples and oranges and put them together. Garbage in, garbage out. Only compare comparable things and only combine, combine combinable things. The, uh, after this meta-analysis was published, it angered a lot of senior neurosurgeons in, neurosurg uh, neurosurgeons in, in our field, and they even, for example, Edward Laws said, eventually with, with or without the use of meta-analysis or randomized clinical trials, we will be able to evaluate uh, the techniques with regards to outcome because they, they couldn't understand why, I mean, a meta-analysis should say to state that the endoscope had uh, more complication than the microscope because practically they, they never saw this during clinical practice. So doing a meta-analysis is easy, but doing a good one is actually very difficult. And we urge young neurosurgeons to be able to learn the techniques of doing a meta-analysis. So to be able to do conduct good research, report the studies very well. You need to be able to, uh, uh, certain guidelines have been developed recently called the, uh, the Equator Guidelines. Equator stands for enhancing the quality and transparency of health research. So there are st different study, there are, st there are different uh, the checklists for the different study designs. You have the care for case reports, you have the PRISMA for systematic reviews, you have the CONSOL for RCTs, you have the STRAP guidelines for analytic observational studies. So if you apply these guidelines, you should be able to report the studies appropriately. We therefore urge uh, neurosurgeons, we urge reviewers, we urge editors in chief of journals that they should be able to make sure the studies are written and published appropriately to ensure that there is no misclassification of study designs in neurosurgery. The, uh, aside the problem of quality of research, we've also noticed that this problem of the quantity, as I said, this problem of equity in the studies in, in research. More of the studies come from HICs, high income countries, and very few come from low in income countries, as I showed in the first graph. Up to 75% of studies come from North America and Europe, which leaves the rest of the, the, the rest of the world just with about 25%. We did a study uh, in the WFNS Young Neurosurgeons Forum, and we, uh, the young neurosurgeons identified research as actually a problem with them because most of them do not, are not well equipped or armed in conducting research. Up to 60% in, uh, in low income countries identify research as a problem compared to 34 in uh, high income countries. And in Africa, the situation is almost similar up to 70% of the young neurosurgeons in Africa identify research as an issue. In the paper which we published with the, with the, with the Harvard group, we saw that the, the problem of research equity is ubiquitous and, and authors from HICs are actually contributing to this. We realized that most of the papers published in global neurosurgery, they have as first and last authors uh, coming from HICs. So we therefore encourage that papers that have to deal with issues related to low income countries, we encourage those who are funding these studies to have uh, authors from LIC, uh, uh, LMIC to be able to participate in these studies as either first and senior authors. This is a paper which we published recently about a traumatic brain injury. And as I was saying before, most of the TBIs occur in low-income countries, but most of the evidence comes from high-income countries as uh, Professor Savadai always states in most of his presentations. So this poses a problem of generalization of the evidence. There's no problem with the internal validity of these studies, they are conducted in high-income countries. They're internally valid. But now we have to generalize the results of these studies into, into to low-income countries. They, it becomes a problem because these studies were not conducted in some settings. So that's why we need evidence from HIC so that when we are producing guidelines, the guidelines should be able to be applied all over the world and not just guidelines based on data from uh, high-income countries. 
the problems of research methods are very, as I said, are ubiquitous. They stem from the way research is conducted through the way it is disseminated to the way it is consumed. So we encourage researchers to be able to look at into, into, into this so that we should be able to mitigate and narrow the gap in the, between low-income countries and high-income countries. We started providing some of these solutions at the level of the Young Neurosurgeons Forum and the WFNS Young Neurosurgeons Forum. We conducted research courses in Africa. This was the first course which we organized in Kinshasa, and we were able to organize a number of webinars to capacitate young neurosurgeons on research methods. This was a, one of the webinars which we did at the level of the WFNS Young Neurosurgeons Forum, we, whom the guest was Professor Benzel. We've done a number of courses here in Africa. We went for that to, to, to collaborate with journals. In Africa, we were working with the Egyptian Journal of Neurosurgery, the Pan-African Medical Journal, because in Africa, we don't actually have a journal of neurosurgery. And we've also tried to work with, uh, uh, have special issues in some journals to be able to encourage uh, uh, researchers in LMIC to be able to publish their works. And uh, last year, we developed the Journal of Global Neurosurgery, which, uh, which is a free open access journal. And the aim is, or the goal, is to be able to help researchers in LMIC to be able to publish their work without the bottlenecks of a, a, pub a publication fee. We've also tried to encourage collaborative research. This is a paper which, which were actually the first cohort studies uh, done in four African countries. The first multi, the first multi center study done in African country involving four different countries. And we're able to prove that we can have infection rates with shown infection of less than 2% compared to 3 to 20%, which we see across the world. When they were the WFNS Young Neurosurgeon Forum, we keep on encouraging collaboration between young neurosurgeons in the different continents, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Europe, and Asia. And, and as uh, Angelo said before, he's been supporting uh, research across uh, LMICs. The Cambridge team has been one of the teams that's actually putting this into practice. I mean, we've uh, conducted a lot of studies supported by Angelo, the Gino studies, which is one of the biggest studies in traumatic brain injury. It's an example of such collaborative research. We've also tried to encourage medical students in, to conduct research. This is my team here in Cameroon, which I'm building, and I hope in the coming years, they should be able to start doing their own research. We started looking at uh, how, what are the challenges of doing research in Africa, and we've understood that it's because medical students are not actually engaged into clinical research early enough in their career. Sometimes the only study they do, they, they do in their career is their thesis at the end of their medical training, which is not appropriate. So we started encouraging medical students to get into clinical research as early as the third and the fourth years of the clinical uh, of the medical studies. We've had success stories across the world. We've been working with a team in Iraq, and we've had some very wonderful results with Semer uh, uh, Host, which is, who is my very good friend. We've had success stories from Zimbabwe, we've supporting researchers in Zimbabwe to increase on their research output. Here in Cameroon, after since I returned to Cameroon in 2018, we've also tried to encourage the young neurosurgeons to produce more research because we always say research is a bridge to the future. There's no way. You can communicate what you're doing to the rest of the world if you, you, you are not involved in research projects. At the level of WFS Global Research Committee, research is also a very big uh, priority with KIPAC as a chair to be able to do a lot of work. And as I said, one of the, uh, the things we achieved last year was the creation of the Journal of Global Research, and it's actually been put in place to encourage researchers from LMIC to be able to publish their work without high publication fees. With COVID, COVID has changed the whole picture and it, nothing, uh, it seems as if we have to deal with COVID for the next coming years. So we have to look for new ways to be able to keep on working together, even though we cannot meet, uh, meet physically, but we have to uh, maybe use uh, uh, information technology facilities to be able to continue working, continue uh, in neurosurgical education and research training. To conclude, we feel that I uh, always strongly recommend that research is relevant in neurosurgery and we encourage medical students neurosurgical trainees and young neurosurgeons to cultivate a sound evidence-based practice. And they should understand the basic of bio, by biostatistics, the basics of clinical epidemiology, and understand how to apply research evidence to patient care. And we encourage researchers in LMICs and HIC to be able to collaborate to, so as to narrow and mitigate the research equity gap that's existing between HICs and low-income countries. Thank you so much for your attention. I, I work here in Cameroon. Cameroon is a country found in Central African Republic. And I am here in the northern part of Cameroon. In 2018, when I arrived, I was sent here as I was already single neurosurgeon covering up a population of about 10 million. Uh, the government just announced recently that they're going to create a neuroscience center here. And in, uh, one another colleague has been sent. So we're going to be two of us here covering this uh, white population. I also teach neurosurgery in the northwest part of Cameroon, uh, which is a population of about 2 million. So we're trying our best to, despite the deficiency in neurosurgeons, to be able to provide uh, optimal patient care to be academic neurosurgeons, not only treating patients, but involved in education and training and also conducting research. So thank you so much for your kind attention and thanks for the invitation. Ignatius, thank you. Thank you very much for this um, very informative talk.
Um, if I uh, may just perhaps kick off the, the questions. Um, so one of the issues that people often raise is, um, you know, is it possible to be technically excellent in neurosurgery, so, you know, be a technically excellent surgeon, and at the same time, do research and publish your research? What, what is your opinion on this? <laughs> and Jonas, I think you are you are a clear example of an excellent neurosurgeon that is doing research. So we the, the the issue is that for a very long time people have believed that research is an issue of high income countries. Uh, in low income countries, we, we cannot do good research. I mean, we've seen that with the support of your team in Cambridge, we'll be able to do some good work back in Africa and we're doing some work in Asia and Latin America. So it is possible to be a good neurosurgeon and also be involved in education and training and also be involved in research. That is what we call academic neurosurgeon. The issue is you have to know how much time you allocate for patient care and how much time you are going to allocate for education and training and how much time you are going to allocate for research. For example, in my settings, up to 70% of my time is on patient care because I'm, I'm, I'm the only single neurosurgeon. I also try to spend some time, maybe 10 to 15% of my time to do research. And I also travel to university to teach. So in, 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 in Cambridge, for example, with Angelos, he has a team working with him. I mean, he has the resources, everything is there. So he can say maybe he can say 50% of his time is going to be on clinical care, maybe 30 on research and 20 on teaching. So it depends on where you find yourself. There's no one, there's no, uh, there's no ideal programming for everybody. You have to know your setting and don't try to uh, look at your time in respect to what you want to do. Good, yeah, no, I, 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 you know, as you know, I fully agree with you on this. Um, it, it just, you know, as, as you know, there are some people, you know, who are probably a minority, I would say, in your surgery, but, you know, they sort of are proponents of the view that all you need to do is just learn how to operate and operate only and nothing else. Uh, you know, that's the way to uh, be a good neurosurgeon. You shouldn't be wasting time to publish your um, papers. You shouldn't be wasting time to do any research. You know, just operate, operate, operate. Again, I probably know what you're going to say to this, but um, what are your views on this? You want me to comment? Yeah, do you, yeah, if you have a Yeah, comment. well, of course, you know, I've been attacked several times uh, by some uh, can put surgeons who believe that to be a good neurosurgeon, you only have to be in the theater. As I said, this is not true. To be, there's no way, I mean, some of the best neurosurgeons we've seen in the world are people who, I mean, they practice, they do their, they practice neurosurgery, they're involved in research. I mean, you can, can cite, I don't want to call names here, but we've seen that it's actually very possible. If you just based on treating patients, I think most of the work you do is going to be lost because how do you use the work you've done to teach future generation if it's not published? Nobody's going to know. Imagine a scenario where the work of Harvey Cushing was never published. How do we learn from that? So the only way you can learn from that is through research, docu documentation of what we do and getting it published. So I totally disagree with the fact that to be a good neurosurgeon, you only have to be in the theater, in the theater without being involved in research. No, you can be an excellent neurosurgeon being in the theater and doing research. The only thing that you need to build a team, you need to be able to know how to use your time, time management. Time management is crucial. I need to build a team because you cannot do everything alone. Yeah, and probably you need 48 hours in a day. Yeah. <laughs> so are there any questions from any of the panelists or any of the uh, uh, audience? Yeah. Uh, can I ask? Uh, yes, surely. Uh, uh, thanks uh, for a very nice uh, talk. Uh, I just have uh, two questions, uh, or probably it's part of the comment. Uh, in my opinion, a uh, case series uh, cannot be considered part of cohort study or case control uh, simply because the usually case series are uh, involve a very small sample size and where you can actually do a sample size calculation you can determine the power of the study so definitely you cannot compare with other studies and usually this very true scenario for neurosurgery because uh, most center, neurosurgery itself is some uh, uh, treating some rare diseases and and that's where the martial uh, center study would be required if you want to do a proper uh, so-called research study. Uh, and then uh, my second uh, comment is uh, regarding uh, RCT. RCT has been always on the top and uh, as shown uh, by our speaker. But however, the problem with RCT is uh, the, the group are artificially created uh, due to the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, this, this we can understand because 
the main reason is to reduce the confounding factor so we can analyze our clinical question rightly. Uh, but again, now we see many centers now using big data uh, showing the real uh, population risk and effect and outcome uh, rather than artificial result from an RCT. I just uh, probably get a, a comment from our chair and also our speaker. Thank you. I, I, I can go first, perhaps, on this. Um, so, uh, you know, as you probably know, I have uh, published um, a couple of RCTs, and I'm, um, you know, we currently have some other RCTs uh, in the stage of publication. But, you know, I don't just do RCTs. You know, it depends on the question, really. And, you know, I keep telling this to people, you know, who say, oh, you know, RCTs are not to be used in neurosurgery, you know, they don't serve uh, our patients or our um, sort of profession right. Uh, it, it all depends on the question. So if you have a question that can be answered with an RCT, then my view is that an RCT should be done. But there are many questions in neurosurgery that an RCT wouldn't be suitable for. So, you know, questions looking, for example, around, um, you know, the risk factors or, you know, the natural history of the disease. Uh, even the question that, you know, uh, Ignatius mentioned, you know, the microscopic and en endoscopic techniques, you know, for a uh, pituitary either surgery, you know, I, I am trained in both, but I'm more comfortable with the endoscopic. So, you know, how you can really run an RCT, you know, when you have, um, you know, people who have expertise in either or, you know, there are some forms of RCTs that you can have expertise based randomization, but they're just very impractical because, you know, patients would have to move you know, away from the place where they live to go to a unit that, you know, provides that allocated uh, treatment, allocated, I mean, from the RCT. And, you know, then there are issues that, you know, you would be operated by somebody that you haven't met. So, you know, it, it would be very, very messy to do such a study. So, on the other hand, you know, the study that we recently published um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, you know, that was the study of dexamethasone, so whether we should be using dexamethasone for chronic subdural hematomas. You know, that is actually, in my view, a very good study to do an RCT on. And in fact, you know, the results surprised us all. So, you know, even though the rate of recurrence was reduced by the use of dexamethasone, which is what, you know, we uh, were expecting from the published paper so far, because we looked at the six months out, the six months outcomes, we realized that actually the outcomes were worse with dexamethasone. And this hadn't been proven in any of the previous studies because you know people were looking just at the recurrence and they were saying, right, the recurrence is lower with dexamethasone, we should be using it. So I, I, I think you know, this just is a very good uh, example of why we need RCTs, because you know if you don't do a proper study to be able to address on the known and unknown um, confounding factors, then you know some of the results might not be uh, uh, sort of might be difficult to to interpret. Um, the other issues with RCTs is that, is that you know, and I think you know, as surgeons we are notorious for that, is that if a result of an RCT is a result that we like, then we you know, then we like RCTs. If the result of an RCT is a result that we don't like, then, you know, we uh, say, oh, you know, RCT is not the right field for neurosurgery. Uh, so, you know, that's just a joke, really. That, but, you know, it, it, it is true, I think. It, it does happen a lot. So, I mean, you know, just to summarize, I think that, you know, RCTs have a role to play in neurosurgery, but we need to be selecting those questions very carefully. And, uh, uh, you know, I fully agree that we shouldn't be doing RCTs for everything. Ignatius, did you want to comment on this? No, 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 I think yeah, your response is perfect. You know, it depends on the research questions you want to answer. There are some questions that can be answered with the cohort study. There are some questions that can be best answered with the a survey. There are questions that can be best answered with the RCT. So, no, no RCT doesn't answer all the questions in your research questions. So. Right. If I may comment, uh, Dr. Ignatius, it was a wonderful lecture, and I sincerely appreciate. Thank you very much for pointing out the the research quality issues in Africa, especially as Africa. Let me say that the problems are universal all throughout the LMIC, it's not only in Africa. The exposure to quality research in the undergraduate curriculum is the main issue 
everywhere in all the LMICs where students are not taught the importance as well as how to perform quality study. And it is just meant as a means to pass the exam rather than inculcating into their own practice. And I uh, sincerely appreciate that you pointed out this very rightly. And uh, one comment to Dr. Kolias' views about mixture of surgery and research. My earlier mentor, Professor Jacob Balapart, used to say that uh, surgery is a right combination of arts and science. Some people practice it at only arts, which is fairly dangerous, while others practice it at only science, so that is even more dangerous. So you have to have a fairly good combination of both, and that's why research is very, very important in neurosurgery. Thank you very much. Liu, over Thank to you. you. Is there any question from other panelists? Professor Harvey or Professor Kurozumi, do you want to give any question? If, if not, then we would like to call upon Dr. Kolais uh, for the uh, uh, sum summary uh, uh, remark before we move to the next speaker. Dr. Kolais. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I think, you know, that I'm speaking on behalf of all the um, panelists and the attendees uh, when I'm going to say a big thank you to Ignatius for um, giving us this wonderful lecture. Um, if I may say, I think the issues around the code of research are not just unique to LMICs. Uh, you know, the issues around misclassification of studies, etc. They apply also to high-income countries. What is different, though, and what we are um, striving to improve is the capacity uh, of LMICs to conduct to conduct research. And you know, I say we will carry on working closely with our um, colleagues in, in LMICs so that we can advance global neurosurgery, allow the provision of high quality neurosurgical care to all patients when needed, regardless of where they live. Um, so I don't want to delay the rest of the uh, webinar any longer. Uh, again, just thanks very much to um, the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Thanks very much to Professor Kudi, Professor Liu. And I'm looking forward to the second part of the webinar today. Thank you. And thank you, thank you uh, very much. And uh, I hope uh, both uh, speaker and chair can stay back for the next lecture. Uh, now I call upon uh, Professor Kurozumi uh, to introduce our next speaker, Professor. Okay, before, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Injun Tennis. Uh, yeah, very good, nice uh, lecture. Okay, next uh, session is, uh, uh, I'd like to thank Professor Kato and uh, Professor Raj for giving me the opportunity to be the uh, chairperson in this session. Uh, first, I'm Kazuhiko Kurozumi, Department of Neurosurgery from Hamamatsu University School of Medicine, Shizuoka, Japan. The metabolic genes, including uh, isocytoblated uh, dehydrogenase, IDH1, 2, are uh, frequently mutated in gliomas. IDH mutation has a remarkable neomorphic activity of converting alpha ketoglutarate, alpha KG to 2 hydroxyglutarate 2HG, which is now commonly referred to as an oncometabolite and the biomarker for gliomas. Today, Professor Wu Wei is specialized in neuro-oncology and immunotherapy. His research interests, his research interests are epigenetic and metabolite uh, mechanisms of glioma. He is focusing on real time intraoperative detection of metabolic profiling in IDH mutated glioma. Uh, Professor Liu Wei uh, performed PCR sequencing and immunohistochemistry staining, and uh, gas chromatography mass spectroscopy were applied to uh, identify IDH mutation in gliomas. And the sensitivity and specificity of these strategies were compared. Today's talk is entitled uh, Rapid Real-Time Intraoperative Detection of Metabolic Profiling in IDH Mutated Glioma with Mass Spectroscopy. Uh, Professor Hu Wei, please start. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for your introduction. Thanks to uh, our beloved host, uh, Dr. Liu. One second, let me show, show the slides. 
So can you see the slides? Yes, Professor. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's my great honor to be here uh, to introduce a new technique uh, used in the OR. Uh, it's called rapid real-time intraoperative detection of IDH mutation. Uh, actually, we have focused on this topic for uh, quite a few years. Uh, I don't know how many of our audience have the background of gliomas and IDH mutation. You know, IDH mutation is a very important biomarker in gliomas. Uh, for WHO CNS5, the updated uh, classification of uh, CNS tumor, the pathology update, uh, the molecular event becomes more and more important, especially for gliomas. Uh, for example, the IDH mutation, IDH mutated, mutated glioma, which means it is a different glioma. And uh, as we know, as we all know, glioma is uh, so dismayed and uh, the prognosis is uh, very, very poor. And uh, most uh, chemotherapy and targeted therapy would be blocked by the uh, blood brain and the barrier. Uh, but in 2008, uh, a group from Duke, they find uh, IDH mutation in gliomas by sequencing. And uh, interestingly, this kind of uh, tumor, this kind of brain tumor, we call IDH mutated gliomas, it occurs almost 80% in grade two and grade three gliomas. And we call it a low grade glioma. It's not a low grade glioma, it's low grade glioma. And uh, IDH mutated gliomas favors young patients. They also favor frontal lobe. And uh, many reports showed that IDH mutated gliomas could benefit from chemotherapy and uh, uh, target therapy. I will show you later. And uh, also it could benefit from the uh, extensive resection, uh, from the surgical resection, extensive resection could benefit the, this kind of patient. So this. IDH mutated glioma is so special. So why, why is why is it is so special with IDH mutated gliomas? So this part uh, we are going to the a little bit about a molecular mechanism. Uh, if you are not interested, you can skip this part. It doesn't matter. Uh, as we all know, um, <clears throat> our scientists they find uh, the IDH mutation uh, in I, uh, in gliomas first, and uh, IDH uh, is a key enzyme in the TCA cycle. Uh, it usually will produce RKG, which, which, is, a, which is important in the TCA cycle. Uh, but when IDH mutated, it cannot uh, produce uh, IDH mutation, uh, sorry, cannot produce RKG. And uh, interestingly, the new enzyme could uh, produce a new metabolite we call it 2-HG. The 2-HG, it will normally won't appear in normal tissue or normal brain. So uh, we call it abnormal uh, metabolite. So what is the function of this accumulation of 2-HG? So in culture, <clears throat> so at first the 2-HG, the function is uh, uh, not known. Uh, and uh, structurally, 2-HG is very similar to RKG, uh, except at the carbon-2 position, where the oxygen group in RKG is replaced by a, a hydro side group. So this is very significant because the oxygen group coordinated, coordinated the iron, and it is important for the cat catalysis. So anyway, um, the, the most important issue is uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the 2-HG could bind into the same active site as RKG, which means the most important uh, issue is uh, it will, RK, 2-HG would competitively inhibit RKG-dependent dial or uh, dial oxygen, oxygenate genetic uh, catalysis. So which means alpha 2 hg could functionally affect the uh, brain tumors. 
So this is a similar structure. So you can see uh, it, there is an iron here, you can see. So almost binding the same size. So this is the scheme of the how uh, 2HG affect the alpha kg dependent uh, uh, enzymes. So the bottom line is uh, the bottom line is uh, an example of the jungle jumic uh, domain. So well, this is a molecular. You know, if you not you if you are not interested, it's just fine. So we can see a picture here. So in the normal cells, uh, we only have alpha KG, we have no 2HG. But in IDH mutated gliomas, the 2HG, abnormal 2HG accumulated very high. And the accumulated 2HG could affect the KDM and TET and many important enzymes. So it will affect the epigenetic regulation. So it uh, will affect the glio, uh, glioma genesis. So this is why IDH mutation is so important in gliomas. Uh, since it's so important, it affects the prognosis a lot. So uh, the new version of the WHO uh, classification has included the IDH mutation. So in lower grade gliomas, IDH mutation, 1P19 code deletion, uh, uh, and also total mutation, these three biomarker, micro, biomarkers, uh, we could classify the LGG into five subtypes, which means a uh, different, uh, totally different uh, prognosis. So uh, since we know this is important for the molecular diagnosis, so what is the clinical significance of IDH mutation? As we mentioned previously, the IDH, the IDH1 mutated gliomas could benefit from extensive, also we call it maximal surgical resection. And for uh, IDH Y type, uh, if you resect the enhanced part only, or you resect the enhanced and non-enhanced together, the uh, benefit of the survival is not that significant. But for IDH mut mutated gliomas, if you do a extensive resection, uh, the benefit, the patient will definitely benefit from the uh, extensive resection. So which means uh, it would be important for us to know the molecular state of this glioma uh, in the OR. Uh, also, there is a New England paper and a JCL paper. Uh, I, I bet most of you already knew this. And uh, the IDH mutated LGG uh, could have be sensitive to the chemotherapy, uh, especially for the uh, temozolomide or PCV. So, which means the IDH mutated gliomas could benefit from the uh, comprehensive uh, treatment. And also, uh, <clears throat> also from the anti VGFA uh, targeted therapy. So, the second question can we identify IDH mutation? The answer is definitely sure. Uh, in clinic, we already use a lot of methods to identify IDH mutation. The most uh, important and uh, the most important and uh, most popular one is the sequencing, you know. But the sequencing is, uh, we call it a gold standard. And uh, we use it in the clinic a lot. We also compare the other methods with sequencing. And uh, we the other popular method is IHC staining, since the antibody is quite good. So actually in clinic, the many, in many uh, department, the IHC staining could, uh, uh, we could do the diagnosis with the IHC staining of the uh, IDH1 mutation. But uh, as we know, IDH mutation has many uh, hot spot. So, uh, there is some sen the sensitivity and the specificity is not that high as you uh, think. For example, uh, this is in our cohort. Uh, we found the sensitivity of the IH, IHC staining is only 81.7%, uh, and uh, the specificity is quite high. 
which means the antibody is good. Uh, the specific could reach uh, 92.2 percentage. And uh, some other reports is even higher, but uh, almost, but uh, the antibodies uh, did a good job. So this is uh, the summary of our uh, cohort. So is there any, any other methods to detect IDH mutation? So since the 2HG is uh, accumulated abnormally uh, and it would not appear in normal tissue, so uh, many scientists just want to see MIS, uh, to see MIS to detect the 2HG, uh, could do it or not. Uh, so from UCLA, Linda Liao, their, uh, her group, uh, they tried uh, in 24 patients uh, to use two MRS to detect the 2 HG. Uh, in but unfortunately, they find the uh, 2 HG, the peak of the 2 HG on the MRS was uh, affected by the glutamine, so it cannot uh, differentiate the two peaks. So it is too difficult to identify 2 HG from uh, MRS. Uh, but uh, still, we could uh, uh, around it. Uh, uh, around a, year, a few years later, they some a patient, uh, some group used uh, seven Tesla MIS. Uh, on the seven Tesla MIS, uh, we could identify the peaks uh, clearly. So we could use seven Tesla MIS to identify 2HG. In the meantime, they also some group also used uh, some technique to identify uh, from three dimension uh, uh, MIS. <clears throat> But uh, we also, uh, from our group, uh, some people just used uh, uh, deep learning uh, and uh, uh, artificial in intelligence, AI. Uh, they used the CNN uh, to find the different methods to uh, calculate, uh, to find uh, the different uh, characteristics of the IDH mutation. So we could uh, identify IDH mutation in low grade gliomas. And uh, uh, after training, the accuracy could reach uh, 70, 95 percentage. Uh, but still, we could not solve the general question of overfitting for AI right now. So this is a problem. Uh, also, from our group in our department, uh, we also use the intraoper intraoperative three dimension MIS to delineate, delineate the uh, metabolic prof uh, border uh, delineation of the glioma. We use the, the calling to NA ratio. So, uh, for our knowledge, mm, when the <clears throat> Uh, when we define the calling NA ratio be labeled as low as 0 0.5, then we could uh, identify the metabolic border of low grade glioma, uh, low grade glioma uh, in the OR uh, very quick and uh, clearly. Uh, and uh, five, 15 patients with gliomas were tried in our uh, surgical su su suite uh, with uh, intraoperative MR. Uh, for for low grade glioma, the ratio threshold uh, was uh, 0 0.5 or uh, 1.5. The volumetric difference reached statistically different. For high grade glioma, the ratio of 0 0.5 and one, uh, one point, uh, the corresponsive volume was statically different. So all patients achieved a good prognosis using this uh, metabolic delineation uh, technique. Uh, right now, we are trying to uh, use the uh, 2HG technique to use our, to, to delineate, delineate our uh, intraoperative uh, MR border. So besides uh, MRS, we also use, we also could use PET to differentiate IDH, uh, IDH mutation. So we uh, restrict, uh, retrospectively, uh, analysis the uh, 72 patients, and uh, we find uh, we could use the SUV mean and uh, use SUV max to identify uh, the IDH mutation clearly. 
Uh, so this is uh, this is a IDH wild type. Uh, this is a IDH mutated patients. So the SUV uh, means low. Uh, for the uh, IDH wild type uh, gliomas, the SUV max and the UV, SUV mean is quite high. So besides the PET and MRS, we also use the mass spectry. Uh, we use the uh, LC mass to uh, screen our four, uh, 30 samples of IDH mutated gliomas, and we find uh, some interesting findings. And also we uh, ref we also you will find this metabolite metabolic change uh, to uh, with MRS and uh, it's almost uh, very co consistent. And uh, from previous finding, we in this uh, LC mass we also found the uh, we also found the one of some of the metabolite metabolites. Uh, could upregulate in IDH mutation, mutated gliomas, not just, just 2HG. And we found that the, uh, like proline, proline is uh, synchronous, synchronous uh, upregulate in IDH mutation, IDH mutated gliomas. And uh, we uh, did this cooperation uh, with group from Birmingham. And uh, we found, uh, uh, for example, here, you can see, this is the uh, IDH mutated gliomas with high 2HG. And uh, one of the key enzyme proline, PYCR1, is upregulated. And uh, we also use the uh, tracing technique, and we found that the uh, proline from the glutamate is uh, upregulated, but not from the, uh, uh, the TCA cycle. So, which means the, the uh, proline metabolism is synch uh, synchronously upregulated in the IDH mutated gliomas. Uh, which is uh, coupled to the NADH uh, oxidation. So we published the paper in the uh, cell reports. So uh, since we know this uh, metabolic changes, so how could we rapidly identify the IDH mutation in the uh, operative theater? Uh, as we mentioned previously, uh, post-operative, we have sequencing IHC staining Intraoperatively, we could use PCR, uh, microfluid chip sequence uh, technique, or Raman technique, uh, mass spectra. And uh, preoperatively, we have MIS, 3D MIS, PET, and AI, and many other methods. So, but uh, all, this, uh, all these methods could be only be useful when it comes into the OR. Uh, so for in our group, Dr. Wu also, uh, use a microfluid chip to detect IDH mutation directly. And uh, they could uh, identify IDH mutation uh, in seven min 30 minutes. But uh, unfortunately, the sensitivity and the specificity is not as high as we expected. Uh, for the PCR, we have to design a lot of uh, primers. So uh, they are, it is good, but I also have some questions. So we tried to use the mass spectra to detect the 2HG. Since, uh, you know, as we uh, show, showed previously, the IDH mutation could uh, specifically produce 2HG accumulation. So even IDH2 or other IDH1 mutation, they could still produce 2HG. So we just, we could detect 2HG to identify IDH mutation. We don't need to know which IDH IDH1, IDH2, or IDHR, uh, one, uh, many other hotspots, I don't care. I just care whether it has 2HG or not. So for at the first beginning, we uh, transport our tissue to the adjacent laboratory. And it almost cost our, almost at least three hours. But uh, three hours, we already finished our surgery. So uh, we discussed with our partners and, uh, we use a lot of methods to save times, and then and then we save it to almost uh, fifty minutes. <clears throat> and uh, this is how we uh, save. And uh, when we do this, we find <coughs> uh, two HG peak uh, is is easier to identify. But uh, to save time, 
uh, we found the 2HG and the glutamate. When we do, uh, see this one, when we do the 2HG to glutamate ratio, the IDH mutation is more easily to be identified. So as we previously mentioned, on the MRIs, the peak of the 2HG and the glutamate, they mix together. So Linda Leo uh, cannot differentiate them. But uh, on the mass spectra, you can see here, I will show you later. <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, after modification, uh, we used the short uh, column methods and uh, the whole time could save to almost 40 minutes. Uh, when we uh, spend uh, uh, so many time, uh, so much effort to modify our methods, and uh, suddenly we found, oh, there are some experts, they just do machines. They do mass spectra machines. And uh, when uh, this cute old guy, uh, he's Cook's Granham, he's from uh, Purdue, United States. So he read our paper and uh, he contacted with us and, uh, and we discussed it a lot. And uh, he, he is an expert on uh, mass spectra. He is a chemistry person, uh, not doctor. Uh, so uh, he did a, did a, he could, a, Make a special machine for this for our methods uh, for our uh, uh, for for the OR, and uh, he introduced his uh, student Ouyang Zhen in Tsinghua University to cooperate with us. So, so as you can see, they use the new DAISY technique, not the capillary uh, colon to sort all kinds of metabolites. Uh, this is what we call uh, electron. <laughs> electronic uh, daisy technique and uh, uh, they when you use this technique we can identify idh mutation or 2hg in three minutes you can see here this is a glutamate this is a 2hg so when in the idh mutated gliomas they mix together but on the mass spectra you can see there are two peaks and uh, idh y type there is only one peak only in glutamate no 2hg so this is uh, become an uh, advantage on mass spectra. Even it is a uh, disadvantage on MRS, but it becomes advantage now. So you can see the, the, the result is quite clean. Uh, when we also uh, use this machine to optimize the uh, procedure, and now we could identify 2HG uh, in 1.5 minutes. So it's called a real time. It's very super quick. Uh, when the when your young doctor is trained, so you almost one minute, one minute we could identify. So when you do the surgery, uh, you can just tell you it is IDH mutation or not, or you find that you got your border or your normal tissue or not. Uh, so this is uh, also the idea of eye knife. So this is a real case. So you can see uh, here, you can find a, a right uh, temporal and an insular, right temporal glioma. It is a low grade glioma, as we will see. This is a DTI reconstruction. So it's very close to the uh, functional area. <clears throat> when we do the uh, intraoperative mass spectra, you can see it's a typically IDH mutation. Uh, and uh, yeah, from the images, you can also tell it uh, probably it is uh, IDH mutated gliomas. But uh, unfortunately, the post operative IDH1 mutation is uh, negative. So, what a surprise. When we do the sequencing, uh, we can find it's an IDH2 mutated glioma. So, you can see the mass spectra um, result is more reliable and uh, more quick. Uh, besides uh, 2HG and glutamate, we could also we call it take a metabolic picture of this kind of tumors. Uh, for example, for IDH mutant, mutant gliomas and um, a wild type and a normal, when you do the PCA analysis, you can see the uh, 
according to the metabolic metabolism, uh, except even you already included excluded two HG and glutamate, uh, it could still separate uh, clearly. So uh, we can do this uh, metabolic picture in also uh, three minutes. It's just almost the same procedure, just use some software, software and methods to calculate the, uh, the metabolic profile. Uh, besides uh, IDH mutation the diagnosis, the target therapy is also very important because the IDH mutant inhibitor uh, is also a new, uh, there are many clinical trials on the IDH mutant inhibitor. Uh, so, uh, for this kind of uh, therapy, uh, quick diagnosis, or uh, we call a quick uh, real time diagnosis, molecular diagnosis, is not only for uh, diagnosis, but also could be could benefit the patients from the uh, treatment. So thanks for our group, uh, for the all the guardians, and uh, for the, all the efforts on uh, this work. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very nice talk. And uh, we are very impressed. We are very rapid uh, assay. We are great. And uh, this is a uh, 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 please show the, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, finally, uh, uh, IDH, uh, IDH mutated gloom is very important. Uh, second thing is uh, how to detect uh, the IDH uh, mutated gliomas with uh, MRS or uh, 3D MRI and intraoperative MRI and the FDG PET, uh, LC mass. And uh, so question three is uh, uh, how a yeah, very rapid uh, diagnosis uh, he performed. Then our uh, uh, yeah, I I read the paper that, that was uh, showed uh, 40 minutes, but uh, today's data is uh, uh, he showed uh, uh, three minutes and 1.5 minutes. Very uh, impressive. So yeah, great. So laughing is uh, uh, he also uh, told that uh, IDH um, uh, IDH mutated inhibitor mutation inhibitor. Uh, that is uh, ongoing uh, clinical trial and so on. Yeah, very nice talk. And let's now let's open questions and comments from the audience or panelists. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rozumi and uh, Professor Harvey for a nice presentation. Probably I start with two questions, uh, uh, Professor, if uh, allowed. Uh, first, uh, I, I just want to ask Professor regarding the the classification of glioma, because the blue HO, despite with the molecular classification, they still stick with the uh, grade uh, one, two, three, and four. And, 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 and uh, you have clearly shown that the, the molecular uh, classification is very important uh, to determine the prognostication and also the treatment. And what is your comment about the, the current uh, classification? With, uh, remain, uh, we, we're still using the existing uh, grade one, two, three, four. My second question, Professor. Uh, Regarding the the metabolite, uh, usually in in the pre-op uh, imaging, uh, we usually use a, a long echo time for the MRS to look at the choline and uh, NAA peak for high grade glioma, and and I, I believe that uh, to 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 see the two HG, you need to have a short uh, echo time where where the glutamate was uh, identified. So would that be be a consistent uh, preoperatively? Detection of two HG and also intraoperative uh, finding uh, of, of that. Uh, and my, my last comment, Professor, regarding the, the need to have a frozen section uh, in surgery, especially glioma, do you think that with, with this uh, uh, point of care mass uh, spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopy, we replace the need of a frozen section? Thank you, Professor. A uh, very good question, very professional. Thank you. Thank you for your good questions. The first one is uh, the biggest, uh, it's a, it is a big question. Uh, since traditionally we classify gliomas uh, to grade one, two, three, four. And uh, uh, right now we call a grade two and a grade three together, we call it a lower grade glioma. And uh, for grade four, 
for glioblastoma. Uh, here, right now, for the WHO CNS5, we already defined the, uh, redefined the uh, glioblastoma. Uh, many, uh, we 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 use we do not use the uh, glioblastoma uh, this concept anymore. We use we also we call uh, astrocytoma IDH mutated. Uh, we call it uh, integrated uh, diagnosis. So as we mentioned previously, the molecular events is becoming more and more important. For example, if if the patient got a CDNK. Uh, 2A deletion or 2B deletion, the gliomas could be upregulated to grade four immediately. So, which means the this kind of molecular events is quite important. So, this is a very big question. So, uh, uh, I think uh, maybe next time or uh, for other chance we could discuss this uh, because right now in China. We have a lot of conference. We are talking about uh, this question right now. This is a very uh, big and uh, important issue. So the second one is the. Uh, so the second question is talking about the. Uh, sorry, talking about what? The preoperative uh, imaging MRS, uh, because uh, in preoperative. Oh, the calling and the NAA, right? Yeah, uh, the calling and the NAA is. Uh, uh, we also uh, investigate a lot of metabolisms, metabolize here, and uh, we uh, check the calling and also NA in our uh, with my, our uh, mass spectrum machine, uh, and uh, it would be easier to check this on the uh, mass spectrum machine. And uh, for the IDH mutation and wild type, there is also uh, a difference. Uh, so. Uh, which is consistent with our previous finding, uh, but uh, for the we when we check the this metabolize on the MRS, uh, it would be it there is some difficulty because when we use the uh, MRS uh, the software, if you want to analyze all these methods, uh, it's not that easy. And uh, right now, commercial uh, software we could uh, identify calling and NA this. Uh, routine metabolize very well, but uh, for a uh, new uh, metabolize, uh, for example, we try to identify some other uh, urine cycle metabolize on the uh, meta uh, on the MIS. We use a UC model, uh, LC model. Sorry, uh, we use the LC model and many other methods to try, uh, but uh, uh, it would be lucky for us to find a uh, appropriate metabolize find on MIS. So it's different. So different uh, technique would be uh, appropriate for different metabolites. Uh, so the third question is uh, uh, about the frozen pathology. Uh, this is a very important one because actually uh, for most of glioma surgery, we will do the frozen, post uh, frozen pathology. And, uh, uh, we ask the pathologist to give us the results in 30 minutes. So that's the first trial. We try to short our time to 30 minutes. Uh, but still, um, for many, uh, for many um, surgery, it cannot, they cannot tell us definite, cannot give us definite question, uh, results. For example, uh, so for some low-grade gliomas, they just call it uh, glial, glial, uh, gliogenesis. Uh, just, there is no, not, uh, no uh, tumor uh, population. So we don't know if it is low-grade glioma or just microglioma. So uh, for this kind of situation, the mass spectra would help a lot. Uh, for another case, we uh, did it twice. Uh, did a uh, frozen pathology twice for the post uh, for the first pathology frozen pathology it cannot tell uh, but uh, we use the mass spectra we find it's IDH mutated uh, and then we send another uh, frozen pathology and uh, this time they find um, it is uh, a glioma and uh, we also run the um, mass spectra machine again and still it is IDH mutated glioma. So this it could 
uh, for biopsy or for some special situation, this, help, this could help a lot. So that's the reason why we neurosurgeons want to develop this machine, this technique. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, I, I, if I may ask Professor Harvey, what is the cost of this uh, equipment that you have procured in your department? As you can see the uh, picture in the slides, uh, the machine is small. So the cost is quite low. And uh, the only cost, uh, the, the, the machine itself, it is uh, around, uh, let me see. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure because I, I, I don't know how well the company, they will uh, give the price. Uh, but uh, each time, each time we have a small box, uh, like uh, that one is uh, would cost around, uh, uh let me see around uh, 100 dollars around yeah so so uh the cost is many the, the the small little box uh, the machine itself is not expensive it's quite small you can you can think it take it as a uh cut uh, a cut machine cut a um, spectrum because the yeah, mass factory is huge and uh, very expensive, but another one is quite cheap. Other questions? Yeah, very quite cheap, yeah. <laughs> very nice technique. I, I have a, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, uh, you show the DAISY technique uh, and also uh, uh, a special, mass, uh, special technique uh, that is, uh, it takes uh, 1.5 <coughs> minutes. So do we need the special machine for that? All right, the machine yes. what? Ah, do, you, do, we, do we need uh, to buy that special machine to analyze? Yes, 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 yes. Mm. Okay, so one last question is, uh, uh, you showed a metabolic picture, so very beautiful column. So how do you use uh, in the future? So with that picture? Uh, actually, uh, as we discussed with uh, Cooks Granham, the Professor Cooks Granham, uh, Purdue from the United States, and uh, they designed this machine specially for tumor resection, but not for brain tumor. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to do it for breast cancer and uh, uh, esophageal cancer, but uh, unfortunately, most the surgeons they don't need this machine because mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 they, they don't care about the, the uh, boundary, you know. Uh, they will do extensive resection. For most uh, new, uh, surgeons, they will, for esophageal tumor, liver cancer, or non cancer, they will do extensive resection. So they don't need to do the uh, yeah. identification. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but for brain tumor, it's different. You know, it's all functional area. So we need to identify, oh, we are close to the uh, functional area. So we need to identify this is a tumor or normal tissue. So if the four IDH mutated gliomas, if the 2HG decreased, which means uh, it, will, it will become normal tissue. So this is so important for neurosurgeon. So that's, a, that's different. And uh, for uh, a guy from uh, UK, uh, they, he invented the eye knife. So in the future, as you mentioned, in the future, we will use the eye knife like a QSA and then connect it to the mass spectra. Then we just, we don't, we don't need to do by us neurosurgeons. The machine itself will tell you how to delineate the tumor, how to cut, uh, when to stop, something like that. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, any questions, others? Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, can, can I summarize that? Yes, okay. Possible, please. Okay, today, uh, so, uh, so Dr. Huawei, uh, he showed a rapid diagnosis of the IDH mutation. 
uh, this is uh, urgently need to help neurosurgeons to design strategies for treating brain tumors for several reasons. Uh, for example, uh, IDH mutation can distinguish LGG from gliosis and normal brain tissues. And two HG concentration usually sharply falls among the margins of gliomas, which is very helpful for recognizing the tumor boundary. Uh, his paper discussed about that. So, yeah, thank you very much. I'm very sorry to have to limit the interesting discussion on this paper, but we have to close this session. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Rosumi and uh, Professor Harvey. Uh, now we uh, at the end of the uh, uh, webinar today. On behalf of the Education Committee and the Professor uh, Yoko Kato, uh, I would like to thank both speaker, Professor Inetus uh, Essin and uh, Professor Harvey Huawei, uh, and the Chair, Professor Angelos uh, Kolais and uh, Professor Kazuhiko uh, Kurozumi for the time and support for the education activity of the ACNS. A special thank to Professor Zubin for broadcasting today webinar on WeChat channel and uh, in China. So until we meet again next Wednesday, it's bye-bye from all us. Thank you uh, very much uh, for joining. Thank you, Professor.